Well, hello. We are on chapter 24, the perseverance of the saints. What does that mean? What, who are the saints? Um, saint means holy, set apart. That's what... Hello. Hello. So we are on chapter 24 this week, the perseverance of the saints. What does that mean? Well, who are the saints? You are. If you are in Christ, if you're a Christian, you are a saint. You are set apart for God's purposes. Saint means made sanct to sanctify or to make holy. And that's what we've been made in Christ. Perseverance, though, what's that all about? Perseverance means not giving up, even in the midst of trials. So basically what we're saying is what does it mean to remain a Christian? Can we, you know, are we always a Christian? What about people who seem to have given up on their faith? This is the fifth of, of um, fifth unit of our series, and it's all on what's called the doctrine of the application of redemption, a fancy way of saying um, how is it that God brings us to himself, reconciles us to himself in Christ. Uh, there's different ways to look at it, different maybe steps, I guess, if you will. Most of them involve God's work, not necessarily our own. Um, so we've already talked about who God is, who we are in relation to him. We found out that uh, our relationship has been broken because of sin, can only be made right through Christ. How is, the, how is what Christ did on our behalf, his atoning sacrifice, how is that, um, you know, applied to us? And so that's the section that we're on. And uh, so this is chapter 24, Perseverance of the Saints. So a couple questions, key questions. Can true Christians lose their salvation? And, uh, and then how can we truly know if we've been born again? So that's what we'll be attempting to answer through looking at uh, most of the scripture passages, all hopefully. Uh, sometimes there's so many we can't look at them all, but uh, for the most part, looking through the Bible, what does it have to say about this topic? That's what we've been doing all the way through systematic theology. What does the Bible have to say about any given topic? In this case, perseverance of the saints. So well, let's define it. The perseverance of the saints. This is going to be the position that we're taking and defending. Uh, we'll talk about uh, it's, it's a, a source of disagreement among Christians. So we will be talking about um, an opposing view. So the perseverance of the saints means that all those who are truly born again will be kept by God's power and will uh, and will persevere as Christians until the end of their lives. And that only those who persevere until the end of their lives have been truly born again. Okay, so it's a, we're looking at the perseverance as evidence of salvation not, and, uh, and a result of salvation, not something that we have to accomplish in order to earn salvation. So, big difference. Um, so, it's meant as an assurance to those of us who are truly born again. Um, it, it's, it's meant to, to say uh, this is one of those evidences of the Christian life that we're born again. It's a source of great controversy among Christians. I'll talk about both sides. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, in different denominations, people might refer to this in different ways. Um, so it's also known as uh, eternal security or the eternal security of the believer. Um, so part A, I want to make this statement, uh, I guess, uh, you know, breaking down our definition. All who are truly born again will persevere to the end. Um, so uh, I don't want to say must persevere to the end. Um, will pers It's just a fact. It's, it's what we do as born again Christians. So, um, so the, only, the only conclusion we can reach is that those who don't persevere um, for some reason, and, and, and by the way, I'm not so sure that we can really define what it means to persevere. Uh, surely there's many Christians who enter uh, into health problems. Uh, they might not even, you know, they might not read their Bible, they might not go to church anymore. 
uh, Alzheimer's, you know, how does that work? Um, so, but someone who is truly, you know, has no extenuating circumstances and doesn't continue in the faith, you, you recognize it when you see it. So just a few key verses to, to think about. Uh, John 6, 38 to 40, Jesus said, uh, I've come down to heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. He's talking about the disciples and the people who have put their faith in him. He will new, lose no one. Um, and uh, John 10, 27 to 29, my sheep, my followers hear my voice and I know them. They follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. So they shall never perish. Um, you know, means what it says in the original Greek. And no one is able, including ourselves. So that would probably be the biggest, um, uh, you know, fear that we have is that we will come to a point where we abandon Christ, we abandon our faith. Uh, can we do that? And uh, so we believe no one means no one, not uh, outsiders, not you know, any kind of a person who would force us and not even ourselves. So John 3, 36, whoever believes in the son has eternal life, does not say. So a lot of these verses we're going to look at, uh, you know, the key verse is very important or the key word here it is, I think the key word is has. You have it already, eternal life. And I'm going to be referring to throughout this this lesson, the fact that eternal life is something that we were given at salvation. It's something that we are um, experiencing now, and it's something that we will gain in in a fuller measure, in a bodily form even, um, in the final resurrection. So uh, it's something that uh, happens in our life, past, present, and future. John 5, 24, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over. You've already crossed over from death to life. Um, you know, we're dead in our sins, but then we, we're alive in Christ. We're, we're, you know, we're going to see later, we're new creations. We've already come to life. And we're starting to experience eternal life, even now, uh, in the midst of this world. Uh, so some other passages um, that uh, contrast, you know, what do we mean when we're talking about eternal life? Well, it's the opposite of of you know eternal death is that uh, separation from God. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So um, we have to understand also in reading these passages that the common understanding was that uh, you know we are far from God. We are perishing in our sins, and uh, so we're going to find out that it's not that uh, we sin and then God condemns us. It's that no, we're condemned already. We've already sinned. Um, we're already guilty. Um, so um, it's not a matter of the final judgment, will you go to heaven or hell? We're already headed to hell. We're already condemned. We're found guilty. That's the bad news of the gospel. That's why the good news is so good, <laughs> because um, we have to understand that the bad news is, for many in the, in the Bible, it was a given. Not so much anymore. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to convince people that a loving God would ever condemn anyone to hell. That's, uh, you know, for the, the, uh, those who are post-Christian, those who don't, don't understand the Bible, they're biblically illiterate, uh, we make up our own ideas about God, and uh, we say that, well, if God is so loving, he can't punish anyone in hell. Uh, no, that's not uh, biblical. So God so loved the world, we focus on the love part here, but look right in the middle of there. It says um, in John 3, 16 and 17, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So um, God came to save the world. Why? Because the world was condemned already, as it says in uh, you know, John 3, 36. Uh, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. It was already there to begin with. We're all, you know, the minute we sin, um, you know, we're, we're guilty. We are deserving of God's wrath and condemnation. So other passages, First uh, uh, John, I want to take a minute to explain First John. I, I bring up uh, first the book of First John to a lot of people that I meet on the street because they're 
they're church people who maybe sometimes they're they're too uh, they want to try to be so humble that they can't admit that they're they believe they're going to heaven so they think that you know I shouldn't just assume I'm going to heaven um no, we why can we assume that we're going to heaven and still remain humble as Christians it's because it's not based on our good deeds we we know we don't deserve it it's based on what Christ did for us so even though I deserve to be punished uh I can say without boasting or bragging I'm going to heaven why because it's not based on something I've done but what Christ has done for me so we have to understand that um first John was written uh I believe, uh, well, John wrote, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know uh, that you have eternal life. Um, and I think it's important that John put this at the end. This is actually the last chapter of 1 John where this is found. He didn't put it, this was not his opening statement. I'm writing these things. Why? In order that you can know you have eternal life. Why didn't he put it in the beginning? Because if he had said that, and by the way, these things refers to everything he had written in the book up until this point. And so if he had put that in the beginning, um, it would be, we, we as humans would say, okay, well, we're, here's a checklist. How can I know I have eternal life? Well, I better check off all of these things. And I think by putting it in the end of the book, it's, it's uh, crucial that uh, as we've been reading and as we've been recognizing these different things in ourselves, or maybe not, that's how we can know. You know, so it's it's more a matter of what is the evidence? Is the evidence there? Not is it a checklist of things we have to accomplish. Um, Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation, no guilt for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans eight thirty, for those he predestined, he also called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And the glorification is uh, something that we won't experience until we receive our resurrection bodies in heaven. Um, so this is, you know, it's, it, but it's written as it's, as if something in the past. Why? Because it's God's promise that if he did these other things in our lives, he will do this also. So it's written as, as if it's already done, even though it's something that will happen in the future. It's a sure thing. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. Um, and you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The, so when we say that we've, we've come to Christ, we, we invited Jesus into our heart, maybe, is the language some people use. What it's talking about is the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. Rather than just affecting us from the outside, he comes to live within us, and he's like a deposit. And I think I probably should have highlighted this word, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those in Christ, in God's possession. Guarantee, if God guarantees something, that's the best guarantee uh, ever. Um, oh, I'm looking at the wrong screen, so I'm sorry, glorified wasn't up there. But uh, all right, First Peter three or one three to five. Uh, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Why? It's kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power, not by our own power, not by our own strength to persevere, but by God's power. Uh, Romans 13, 11, um, and do this understanding uh, the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. I think that's important because a lot of times when we look at our lives, we, we think, well, I'm if we were to graph it, there's a lot of ups and downs and maybe backsliding, and we feel like we made progress, you know, two steps forward, one step back. But at every point in the journey, even if we're down in a valley, even if we feel like we made some steps back, our salvation is nearer than the day before. Um, that's because it's such a sure thing. Uh, it's something that God is working in us. And even through all the hills and valleys, mountaintop experiences, whatever, uh, we're constantly moving forward. Just physically, we're, we're closer to the day of our salvation, you know, time-wise. But also, um, even those difficult times, I believe God is working through that uh, and uh, accomplishing in us what he wants to accomplish. But our salvation, the day of our salvation, is steadily nearer, no matter what. Um, 1 Peter 2.2 2 talks about, like, 
newborn babies craving spiritual milk so that if you grow, grow up in your salvation, it's something that we're maturing in. It's something that we already have, but we're, we're, we're maturing in. And uh, so that means it's a sure thing. It's just that we're growing. There's changes that we're making. We shouldn't, um, um, you know, uh, we shouldn't think that uh, it's something that we have to earn. Only those who persevere to the end have been truly born again. So to the Jews who believed him in John 8, 31 to 32, Jesus said, if you hold to my tr teaching, you are really my disciples. He didn't say will be. Hold to my teaching and you will earn it. You can prove yourself. You know, I'm going to put you through these tests. And if you hold on, that's what earns you salvation. No, he earned it for us on the cross. But what's the evidence that you've received that? Um, it's your perseverance. Matthew 10, 22. You'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is one of those verses that I think, taken out of context now, can throw people off because it's talking about our future salvation, our more complete salvation, the one that was begun at uh, when we were born again, the one that we have now already, but we will be saved. So uh, that can be confusing. And uh, so that, that shows, you know, that, I mean, that's an example why we shouldn't take these verses out of context. Colossians 1, 22 to 23, um, again, talking about if you continue in your faith, again, this was this is another one. Um, you know, we, we understand or we learn, I learned in confirmation, there's no if then in the, um, in the gospel. But, the, you know, it, really there is, because uh, if, you know, if we are faithful, if we follow through, we will be blessed in certain ways. There, God does have some different agreements. Um, if you continue in your faith, this is not necessarily saying if, you know, your faith will save you. It's just saying if that faith is there, if that evidence is there, that perseverance is there, yeah, you'll have all of these things. Um, you will be in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So again, I, I don't think this verse is referring to um, earning our salvation. It's, it's more evidence of what's already happened, salvation. Hebrews 3.14, uh, we've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Now, some people can have that kind of conviction and not be saved, not be born again. They just, they believe, like the, the demons believe. Um, maybe they didn't follow through with, with um, you know, being born again with, with the repentance. You know, maybe that conviction didn't uh, result in anything, but... Yeah, uh, conviction, uh, heartfelt conviction is definitely part of the Christian ex born again experience, and we need to hold on to it. If we do, we know that uh, um, we've been born again. So, what is the purposes of these passages to the church? Well, they're not to make those presently trusting in Christ worry that sometime in the future they might uh, fall away. Uh, on the contrary, it's to reassure us if you know if we see that kind of perseverance there. Um, uh, you know, we, uh, we can, we can have assurance. Um, but also it's to warn those who are thinking of falling away or have fallen away, or maybe if you see people around you falling away that they, you, you know, they were never saved in the first place. So all of the times that these verses are used is as an, as an assurance to believers and as a warning to those who could possibly be false believers. So. See, those who finally fall away may give external signs of conversion. So Matthew 26 is, is um, the incident where Jesus was sitting at the table saying someone would betray him. And all of the disciples, instead of turning to snidely whiplash uh, Judas with, you know, the guy uh, with the uh, thin mustache rubbing his hands in the corner, um, they turned to each other and said, who could it be? What we're saying is Judas was not a follower of Jesus. He was going to betray Jesus, and yet he was one of the disciples, and um, they didn't know it. They didn't realize uh, he didn't have the outward signs that we might expect of someone who would be in that position. Same thing can happen in our churches. Um, people can look very good from the outside, and we don't know. Only God knows the heart. Um, and so, um, so it's you know that's an example of someone who, in Jesus' very presence among the rest of the disciples, couldn't tell that he was not a follower of Jesus, uh, not believing in Jesus like the rest of the disciples. Mark 4, 
um, talks about, you know, it's the parable of the different soils and the seed, the, the word of God that's sown in, in the soil of different people's hearts. It says, others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. So joy is definitely a part of the Christian life, but it's possible to have joy uh, and have no root, have no connection to Christ. Maybe the joy comes from, oh, all the people around us that are, uh, you know, uh, in a church that are congratulating us and um, happy for us. And we have the joy of being in the presence of, you know, so many positive people. But, um, but it, it's not rooted in a relationship with God in Christ. Uh, so they quickly fall away. And John um, 15, 1 through 7. Says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. Now, this might be seen as uh, also as one of those verses where, well, if you're not persevering, you're going to be cut off. And the purpose of this verse, this passage, this this really a parable or analogy, is um, is to show that it's the fruit. The fruit is it's not the being cut off from Christ. That's the um, uh, emphasis of this parable, it's, it's do we have the fruit that uh, comes from our connection with Christ? So we shouldn't, there, that would be like saying this, this parable has two separate points, and it doesn't. It's The focus is on the fruit that comes from only those who are tied in with Christ. So many passages in Hebrews affirm that those who finally fall away may give many external signs of conversion, might look in many ways like Christians. Um, why? Because they've been temporarily and outwardly blessed by being affiliated closely with the fellowship of the church. Let's face it, you know, there's many blessings uh, that come with a positive involvement in God's church. Um, and those blessings come from other people. They come from affirmation. They come from, you know, the, the many truths of the gospel uh, or of the Bible, uh, that if you follow them, your life will indeed be blessed. Um, these people might have some sorrow for sin. They repent. Maybe they're just sorry because they got caught, but, you know, they have sorrow for sin. They, they might understand the gospel. Um, other, you know, there's going to be a verse that says they've been enlightened. Well, you know, uh, yeah, th so they have a, a mental assent, a mental understanding, but has it, has it cut them to the quick? Has it affected their heart? Um, they appreciate the blessings of the Christian life, the fellowship, the you know, the, the, the peace that we have uh, in fellowship. Um, maybe they've even had answers to prayers in their own lives. The Bible does not say that God will not ever answer the prayers of non-Christians. Sometimes he does it, you know, non-believers. Sometimes he does it to get their attention, to let them know he exists. Uh, the Holy Spirit is working in many different ways in people's lives. They, people, non-believers can have their, their prayers answered. Sometimes the answer might be no, but sometimes it might be yes. Um, they might have even felt God's power working through their lives. The Holy Spirit can work in any situation he so chooses. Um, and so, you know, you've, I think, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the gifts that are demonstrated on some of these TV ministries, for example, are, some of them are, are counterfeit gifts, I think, from evil sources, but some might even be the work of God and, and people are, the work of the Holy Spirit and people are taking advantage of it for their own um, for their own, you know, benefit. Um, it might benefit some of the people who are listening, uh, some who are believers. So God is not limited to working just in, um, uh, uh, you know, in believers. Uh, the Holy Spirit can work in whoever he chooses. Um, our leaders uh, are oftentimes, usually, probably not believers, uh, but God can work through them. And uh, so uh, why do I say this so confidently? I think in Matthew 7, 22, it's a, an example of that. These people are coming to Jesus. They say, Lord, didn't we do all these religious things? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name, and perform miracles even? Didn't we do all these things? And Jesus said, I never knew you away from me, evildoers. So, yeah, God, uh, you know, these people may be involved in the life of the church to the point where it's seems obvious that they're believers and yet maybe not so how can you know what what is going on here uh it's possible to be involved in the fellowship and hear the truth of the bible hear the truth of the gospel and ignore it um how shall we escape i think this is i think these verses in hebrews 
are talking to belie- uh, non-believers, false, belie- con- false converts in local churches who are surrounded and, in, and caught up in the life of the local church, and they're, yet they're not saved. They're ignoring the salvation, the, the, the verses of the Bible that talk about salvation. They're, um, they are hardening their hearts. Hebrews 3.8 says, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. I think the rebellion is referring to the, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the, the rebellion of Korah in the wilderness. Um, so they turn away from the living God. They harden their hearts. Um, Hebrews 4.7 uh, refers again to harden, do not harden your hearts. It's possible to sit under the truth of the gospel in the Bible and to be among the fellowship of believers and have a heart that has become so calloused that it just goes over your head. Are these people still blessed? I think it's better that probably, maybe, that they're in church, better that they're in church than they're not. I once met a man who, you know, went to a very well-respected church in our area and told me he doesn't even believe in God. I asked why. He said, well, it makes my wife happy. I go, that's why I go. Um, should he not go? No, I think I'm glad he goes. It would be nice if he would just admit to her, to everyone around him, that he doesn't believe in God. But, um, you know, that'd be discouraging to them. But uh, at the same time, you know, I believe he's going to be blessed by his wife's faith. Blessed with salvation, maybe. You know, maybe God will bring him to salvation. Um, but surely it's going to be through her prayers, through the her faith, through the, the preaching of the word that he's sitting under. Um, as he goes week after week to this church, not even believing in God. Um, so here's one of the key verses, I think. Uh, I'm going to read Hebrews 6, 4 through 9. Um, and uh, this is one that uh, makes us think that, uh, you know, people can be believers and, and fall away. It says, it's impossible for those who have once been enlightened. Now, we shouldn't assume that just because they're enlightened, they're, they're saved, they're born again. It, it might mean... And most likely, I believe, means that they have been enlightened. They they understand the gospel. They understand it on a f- academic, mental level. They have tasted the heavenly gift. Doesn't mean they've necessarily received it. But they've tasted it. They've gotten, uh, you know, the gift of. They, they've they've seen what it can be like in the lives of um, people around them. So they've tasted the heavenly gift. Uh, they've shared in the Holy Spirit the blessings of the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of believers. They've tasted the goodness of the Word of God. You know, there's a lot about the about God's Word that isn't necessarily having to do with salvation. It's it's how can God's Word can bless us with all the different principles for living, you know, here and now. So they've uh, received that uh, blessing. So it says, uh, it's impossible for people who have experienced all these things to be brought back to repentance. Does that mean they could never be saved? Um, They've, they've somehow hardened their hearts. I would say it makes it harder and harder as they go along. Is it impossible? Yes, it is. But all things are possible with God. So, um, so I don't think we should be thrown off by even by the uh, verse where it says it's impossible uh, for them to be brought back to repentance because um, God can do the impossible. And we should pray for them and pray that their hearts will be softened and that they'll be blessed by the fellowship, the hearing of the word. It says, to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Um, and then it talks about this land that's producing a crop. It says, the, but it says, never says that they will have that crop of righteousness in their lives. It's more a crop of, uh, uh, of thorns and thistles. So um, and here's another one uh, uh, from Hebrews, uh, second big verse that can throw us off and make us think that uh, we can lose our salvation. It says in Hebrews 10, 26 to 31, if we deliberately keep on sinning. So this would be the um, person who hears the truth, maybe receives it, uh, believes on a superficial level, but their belief doesn't lead them to repentance. They keep on sinning in maybe in just one area of their life, but they they haven't repented of it. Um, so uh, they should expect that... Uh, you know, that they will be judged for that. So I think rather than saying this is um, uh, an example of someone falling away, it's an example of someone who believed on a superficial level, never really was born again. Repentance really definitely is a part of that born again experience. And uh, 
And so we should be warned that if repentance isn't there, um, the evidence isn't there of salvation. So 10, uh, Hebrews 10, uh, so do not, 10, 35 to 36, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you'll have what he has promised. So again, the emphasis on perseverance. Um, some of these verses talks about not shrinking back, and you can be sure that in our life, there will be big times and little times where we will be tempted, our, our faith will be tempted to, we'll be tempted to just shrink back and not uh, exercise our faith that we will. Um, and it says, don't, you know, persevere. It's a, this is just another way of saying, um, persevere in the faith. Those who do, uh, you know, you are rewarded. We're, you know, we're being told to do what God will do in those who believe. Uh, Hebrews 12, 3 says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. Now, I think this is important. Who is it that endured such opposition from sinners? Well, it's Jesus uh, on the cross and, uh, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane and being whipped and carrying his cross and enduring the smocking and the scorning. Um, why should we consider him? Because he's the one who gives us the power to overcome the same thing. So if he can do it in himself, he can surely do it in us. And so, you know, why should why should this encourage us? Because we know it's not our strength that is persevering, it's Christ's strength in us. All right. So um what can a believer do? What can give a believer genuine assurance? So number one, uh, do I have present trust in Christ for salvation? This is important, present trust, because we're not trusting in, you know, we, we all have, hopefully we have some different milestones in our life. Might be our uh, baptism. It might be confirmation. It might be different, uh, you know, times, uh, mountaintop experiences we've had in our lives with Christ. But if we're constantly camping on those back, those experiences from long ago, um, we're, 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 we're ignoring what God is, what Christ is presently doing in our life. So those can be very important if we're at a low in our life and we look back and we're reassured by what God has already done. But uh, we can't, I, I think we have to have a balanced view of the journey that we're on. The things God has done in our lives are very important, but where are we now with Christ? And so that's why Colossians 1.23 says, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, the, you know, the, the emphasis there is on the present. What are you doing in the present? Hebrews 3.14 says, We have come to share in Christ if indeed we uh, hold our original conviction. So. We're going back to that original conviction, that that you know that that milestone in our life where we made a declaration of faith, confession of faith. But are we continuing to hold on to it? That's a present uh, view, and that can encourage us. So our present perseverance can encourage us, even if we've gone through times in the past when we weren't persevering, or if we're afraid that we will go through times in the future. <clears throat> we can have assurance that, oh, hey, where are you right now? Are you in Christ? Um, we do not want you to become lazy, it says in, in Hebrews 6, 12, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. I think, uh, you know, if there's a sin that's pervasive in the Christian church, uh, laziness is a huge one. And a lot of times we think, well, it's just a lazy person. But if you think about it, laziness is one of the most selfish um, sins there are because it's basically saying, we're, we're, you know, we're in a position where God is the king. Christ is the king of our lives. And what are we doing? We're sitting back, kicking our legs up and taking it easy. Um, he's the king. Who are we to say that, you know, my time, I can spend it the way I want to. Um, and that's what we're doing through our actions when we're lazy. Um, John 3, 16. So I just, the thing about laziness, I just want to say that's part of perseverance. It's not being lazy. Is, is Christ continually on the throne of our lives? John 3.16, re returning to that again, but um, just the emphasis here is on believing, your present belief, whoever believes presently in him. Not, it doesn't say whoever believed at one time and made a profession of faith at one time. No, do you presently believe? It's talking to us wherever we're at and however many times in our life when we hear that 
uh, verse, every time it's a different present that we're talking about. It's a different uh, point in our lives. Are we in the faith? You see someone, well, they used to do this, holding up the sign behind the, uh, the goalposts in, the, in a football game, John 3, 16. Do you believe you have eternal life? Should be a, should be a source of assurance for us. So this emphasis on uh, present faith in Christ stands in contrast to the practice of some church testimonies where people repeatedly recite details of a conversion experience they've experienced 20 or 30 years ago. We shouldn't forget those. Again, they're milestones. They're meant to help us through the difficult times, but they shouldn't be the only uh, source of our faith. Um, is there evidence of, so, so what are some of the assurances? The first one was, is there present um, work of God in our lives? Second one, is there evidence of regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in my heart? Okay, well, we're going to break this up into three parts. Uh, a, there is a subjective testimony of the Holy Spirit within our hearts bearing witness that we are God's children. In other words, we're experiencing the Holy Spirit in different ways. Um, so if you are being led by the Spirit of God, you uh, are children of God, it says in Romans 8.14. Um, we experience that, uh, you know, it talks about us living like uh, God is our Father, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. We, we have this, it's not something that I've found that I can even explain, especially to non-believers. They're just kind of like, look at me skeptically. But I can say, I, I feel that fellowship. I feel that inner confirmation of the Holy Spirit. I, I feel the leading as different decisions are made. And, and he's confirming that I'm going in the right direction. You know, this is the way. Go in it, you know, the uh, Holy Spirit is saying, or, or avoid this way. Um, so we, we feel that. Um, and 1 John 4.13 says, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. So we can sense the Holy Spirit in our lives. Not just working on us from the outside again, but working in us. He's given us his spirit. And then Galatians 5.22-23 talks about the fruit of the spirit. If you notice all the different fruits that are mentioned here, they're all aspects of our character and our character should be changing. Uh, to become more like Christ. We have love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, all of these. Matthew 7, 16 is Jesus talking about how do you recognize a tree? You know it by its fruit. How do you recognize yourself to be a Christian or other people to be a Christian? It's the fruit in this. And so here, you know, what Jesus was talking about, well, what is the type of fruit? It's clarified in, in Galatians, the, verse, the passage I read before that. Character change. Do we see our character changing? Um, second thing, so the first one is this confirmation of the Holy Spirit. Second one, we continue. How, do, how can we be reassured? We continue to believe and accept the sound teaching of the church. So usually when we become a Christian, we, 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 um, we learn the basic elementary truths of the Christian faith. Um, Jesus is the Son of God. He, he lived a perfect life. He died and he rose again and uh, sits at, at the right hand of God the Father. Some of those basic truths like we might find in the um, Apostles' Creed. Um, so no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the fa Son has the Father also. This is found in 1 John 2, 23. Basically, it's talking about some, you know, like, uh, again, 1 John is a book written to, uh, you know, show us that, yes, affirm that, yes, we are in Christ. How do we know? Well, we, we still hold on to some of those basic truths like this. Um, I don't think it's limited to this, though, and I've always been a little troubled, like, well, whoever you know, affirms the Son. I think it's meant to be a, a you know, an example of some of the basic truths of the Christian faith, because even demons affirm that Jesus is God's Son. They know this fact. First John 4, 6 says, we are from God, and whoever God knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God, when he says we, he's talking about himself and the other disciples. He's writing this to the church as a disciple, and he says, um, whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And so now, how do we hear the disciples? Well, we hear, we read this letter. We read the different uh, uh, scripture from the disciples, and we listen, we obey it, we follow it, we believe in it. Um, so uh, this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. And then C, we, you know, we have this present continuing relationship with Christ. Um, we remain in him. Like a, like a branch bearing fruit has to be connected to the, the trunk. 
We can't bear fruit without him. Um, for John 15, 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. So we're following his teachings. We're um, holding fast to the truths that uh, Jesus shared. Um, 1 John 2, 4 through 6, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, so it's not just listening to his word. You know, listening actually is hard enough for the non-believer. Uh, you know, most non-believers do not read the Bible. They don't spend much time with it. They can't stand it. You know, they, it gets too hot in the kitchen and they get out. Uh, so, you know, listening is, you know, is a part of it, but then obeying too. And so there are people who become puffed up with knowledge because they're hearing so much that they just, but they're not obeying it. And uh, it can look pretty ugly in their lives. So um, obedience too uh, lets us know uh, we can't go keep on sinning. Says in First John three nine to ten, uh, we just don't have the desire anymore. Um, you, you know, it, uh, it says, how do we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are? Anyone who doesn't do what is right is not God's child. You know, if God is working in our hearts, if you know, Holy Spirit is there. We're either going to be obedient and happy and joyful, or we're going to be disobedient and depressed and um, uh, feeling the grief. The you know, Holy Spirit will be grieving. He doesn't leave us if we're a truly a believer, um, but but he does affect us and could be in negative ways. So he does these things to get our attention. First John three twenty four: the one who keeps God's command lives in him. And... Uh, and 1 John 5.18 talks about not the one who is born of God does not continue to sin. And then three. So first we, we sense the Holy Spirit. We sense the presence of Christ, the connection of, with Christ. And finally, do I see a long-term pattern of growth? And so this is where I'm saying, yeah, we have ups and downs in our life. We might even feel like we're taking steps back, moving backwards in the faith. But is there a long-term growth? If we charted it, would we see it? you know, a, a, a continuing, um, uh, you know, uh, growth in Christ. So, um, therefore, my brothers and sisters, Second Peter 1.10 says, make every effort to confirm your calling and uh, an election. If you do these things, you'll never stumble. What are these things? Well, he said it right before in 5 through 7. He said, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, God, and godliness, uh, mutual affection and love. You know, we should have these things and have them in increasing measure, it says in verse 8. Um, so uh, I recommend keeping a journal. Um, it's been very helpful for me. I can look back and see some of the things I was struggling with, and I'm, I'm reassured that, you know, if something isn't alive, it's not growing not changing. Um, if you see growth in your life, that can be a sign of uh, an assurance of that your salvation is real because you're growing, you're changing, you're becoming more like Christ. So um, John 6.30, doing the Father's will. Um, whoever, uh, the Father's will is that everyone looks to the Son and believes in him um, shall have eternal life. And, our, and the Father's will is that we'll look to Christ and that we will trust in him, but also we become like him. And that's, the, uh, that's one of those fruits of the Spirit. Not one, it's, that's the goal, is to become more Christ-like, more godly. Um, those who believe in the perseverance of the saints, uh, which is the position here, and then those who think that Christians can lose their salvation, the opposite position among Christians, how would they, how, how would they counsel a backslider. Does it really matter if you believe in it or not? Because both, and the word here is both, counsel a backslider in the same way. Stop sinning, repent, and believe in Christ. Uh, if you, um, you know, if you've lost your faith, you are not a Christian. Uh, well, if you lose your faith, you're not a Christian, one side says. And the other side says, well, if you lost your faith, you never were a Christian. Either way, you're not a Christian. So we would counsel them the same way. Um, so what difference does it make? Well, the difference, I think, is, is, well, what is the gospel we're presenting, and is it being watered down? And so I'm looking at the perseverance of the saints 
as a sort of balancing act between being overly confident in our salvation to the point where we think, well, I prayed a prayer, I'm good to go. There's that. And then there's the overly worried view that I could lose it any second. I was a Christian, but I could, I could drop the ball any second. And, uh, and so there's this balance that I believe God wants us to have. The two watered-down versions of the Bible, one is you're, you make a profession of faith, you've been baptized, you're thought to be eternally secure because of a, something you did in the past. And so your, your trust isn't in this present relationship with Christ, it's based on something you did. Or maybe something that God did in the past, but it's still it's not something in the present. Um, and so regardless of what happens in the present, you're good to go. Um, the second one is that they can never be sure of salvation from day to day because it, the whole idea of remaining in Christ and persevering becomes something that we do um, in the present. And so that's the opposite extreme to avoid. So we have to find the balance, and I believe that balance is it's like a tension, and I would, ref, I would call it a tension kind of like um, when people are singing and they're trying to maintain a certain note, well, well they, they do a tremble in their voice. And from what I understand, the reason you do that is because if you just try to remain, keep that note without it changing, it can veer one way or the other without you even knowing it. But if you do the tremolo, you're kind of constantly making adjustments to the point where you can keep it mainly level, mainly at the right tone, um, because there's a little bit of room for error. Well, this is the tension I think that we need to live with when uh, we're told to work out our faith with fear and trembling, as it says in Philippians 2, 12 to 13, therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now more in my absence, continue to work out your faith with fear and trembling. Um, it doesn't say work for your faith. Uh, it's work out, it's work out your salvation. It's, it's working, it's allowing something to be made manifest in your life that's already there. Um, work out your salvation. So it's not working for it, it's not earning it, it's allowing it to come out. And so the, the emphasis is on the present with an, an eye on what God has already done to reassure us. But uh, the fear and the trembling, I believe, comes from you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I mean, wanting to make sure that we're with our Creator forever, why wouldn't, you know, I would fear that. I would want to make sure it's such a great gift. How could we miss it? And also, how could we, you know, He's our Heavenly Father. We don't want to displease Him. We fear displeasing our Father. Even if we know for sure we're going to heaven, we still want to make sure that we stay living the life He wants us to live. And there's fear and trembling in that. But I think the last part of this passage is the most important, for it is God who works in you to will, to give you the desire, to and to act in, a, in order to fulfill his purpose. Um, God wants us to persevere more than we do. You know, God's will is that we would persevere. And, you know, maybe there's times when we would just like to say, you know what, uh, living the way the world does, I, I just that sounds so much easier and more enjoyable on a daily basis. Um, but God wants us to persevere, and if he's the one who wants it more than we do, and if he's the one who's giving us the strength and, and uh, gives us the ability, um, then we can have great uh, confidence in that. If our confidence is in ourselves, uh, yeah, we have every reason to, be, uh, uh, to worry. Um, if our confidence is in our past experience, uh, yeah, we'll probably fall into complacency and laziness. And uh, no, there's a tension there, a fear and a trembling, and that's okay. Um, it's okay to have times of doubt and worry. It's okay to catch ourselves maybe even becoming too complacent. Uh, but let's uh, stay in that middle, uh, that balance. Uh, let's rely on the Holy Spirit within us to help us stay balanced in our understanding of our own salvation and also in uh, our understanding of the salvation of others, the people that we love, the people all around us. So that is the end of this, um, this chapter, and we'll see you next time.